Hi, Rashonda here. We are reading, um, what are we reading? It's in my hand. Oh yeah, Hagar's Daughter by Pauline Hopkins. We are on chapter 18. Let's get this going. The burst of gaiety which the ball brought into Jewel's life made the succeeding days of gloom more depressing. Her high spirits had received a severe shock in her supposed discovery of Cuthbert's treachery from which they rallied with difficulty. Don't stand there, my darling. Those large windows are always drafty. I have no idea who's talking. Her mom, her dad, it sounds like her mom. <clears throat> I feel nothing of the sort, mama. Ah, uh, had I just read a little bit longer. All right, don't stand there, my darling. Those large windows are always drafty. I feel nothing of the sort, mama. Don't libel this beautiful house, if you please. Beautiful house, indeed. I shall be glad when June has come. I long for the breeze of the ranch. There will be more snow by tomorrow, Mama. Of course. It seems to me that everything is out of joint. Think of snow in Washington in March. Jewel left the window where the light was darkening. She smiled at Mrs. Bowen and one could see how wan and delicate she looked. Mama, you are pessimistic today, she said, kneeling beside the fire and stretching out her hands to the blaze. Mrs. Bowen made to reply. In truth, her heart was bitter within her breast. She made an effort to appear cheerful before Jewel, not altogether successful. I mean, I don't know what's on the heart of Mrs. Bowen, but uh, you hate for your kids to be sad, especially if it's not their doing. Like, I, I will be honest. Sometimes my kids are sad from something that was totally their own fault. I don't like it that they're sad, but I really don't have that much sympathy for them. But if something happens that just wasn't through fault of their own or if their hearts break, oh, as a parent, that is really, really hard. And even though Mrs. Bowen is Jewel's stepmother, at least that's what we believe she is, right? That's what we know from what the book has told us. <laughs> that's what we believe. Do we have a reliable narrator? I'm not sure that we have a reliable narrator. We certainly don't have a first person narrator. Um, is everything the narrator revealing to us true? Maybe, maybe not. I don't know, I never thought about the reliability of the narrator in this before because we're getting like each person's perspective. So we see lies that are going on, but there is a lot of truth that has yet to be revealed. Anyway. The two ladies were in the favorite lounging room of the family, the small reception room. Jewel's great mass of bright hair rolled at the back of her small head, seemed too heavy a weight for it, while the hand that held the fleecy shawl about her was so, so shadowy as to fill one with apprehension. Yet she did not complain, only her parents noted the change in her since the night of the great ball, with feelings of uneasiness. My dear, said the senator, senator to his wife in one of their conversations about the best course of the matter. My dear, if it were left to me, I'd shoot Sumner on sight. Out in Frisco, his life wouldn't be worth a cuss. I've as much as I can do to keep decent and not to put a ball into his miserable carcass. Think of a feller philandering after two women to once, either of them handsome enough to satisfy any reasonable man, even if he is dead sot on looks in a female. Blast my eyes, Mrs. Senator. Did he just call his wife Mrs. Senator? Ha <laughs> ha! Blast my eyes, Mrs. Senator. It's lucky we start for Frisco as soon as the session closes. I'd not answer for holding in much longer. Okay, I have never understood dueling culture. It just doesn't make sense to me. We know what's happening with Cuthbert Sumner and Jewel and her family doesn't. So, okay, they believe what Jewel saw was some sort of romantic interlude, even though why she will not talk with him about it is beyond me. But I do not understand dueling culture that says, you have wronged me, now you must die. Death seems so disproportionate to the injury here. My goodness, and even if the intent of a duel isn't death, it's injury. I mean, we're in the 19, no, we're in the 1800s. Yeah, we're in the 1800s here. I mean, there were advances in medicine for sure, but my gosh, can somebody explain dueling culture to me? I've read lots and lots of books that 
have dueling culture and I have never once understood it. Just because you have wronged me doesn't mean you need to be dead. Like, why am I so uptight about this? Or in this case, why is Jewel's father so uptight? I'm like, you're mad. Yes, but people don't need to die. All right. And Mrs. Senator? Okay. Who'd have believed it possible? Sumner seems such a decent feller. Talk about deceit in women. Women ain't in it compared with these Eastern raised gents they call men. Aw, aw, puddin'. We are talking about deceit in women. One particular woman, aw. Then Senator Bowen retired to his club to vent his rage and pushing billiard balls about. It was during one of his fits of impotent wrath that he fell into, that he fell into Major Madison's toils and became an easy victim. Oh, oh my dove, murmured Mrs. Bowen to herself as she had murmured many a time during the past few weeks. My gentle, proud, suffering flower, how I wish I could take the pain out of your young heart and bear it for you. It is so hard to see that look on your child face and feel that the sunshine is gone for you and then realize that with all my love, I can do nothing, nothing, nothing. A woman's life is hard hard from the cradle to the grave. Oh God, why were we made to bear all the punishment for Adam's fall? Let's read that again. A woman's life is hard, hard from the cradle to the grave. Oh God, why were we made to bear all the punishment for Adam's fall? A woman's life is hard. Absolutely. I'm intrigued by why were we made to bear all the punishment for Adam's fall? So in the Bible, in the book of Genesis, God created Adam and then out of Adam, he created Eve. And God told Adam and Eve not to eat from the fruit of the tree in the center of the garden. And that was the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And he said, if you eat from the fruit of that tree, you will surely die. And so Adam and Eve were hanging out one day in the center of the garden and there was the tree and there was a talking serpent which had to freak Eve out. And there was a talking serpent that said to Eve, did God really tell you not to eat from the fruit of this tree? And Eve was like, yeah, he told us not to eat from it and not to touch it. Okay, so she went wrong there. He didn't tell them not to touch it. He just told them not to eat from it. But anyway, and she was like, God said, don't eat from the tree and don't even touch it. Because if you do, you will surely die. And then the serpent, who was Satan, disguised as a serpent, said you're not gonna die if you eat from this tree you're gonna become like god if you eat from this tree and i have always wondered how did they know what death was nothing had died is my understanding um so like i would be afraid of death it sounds horrible but like how did they know what death was so anyway eve ate from the fruit of the tree and then she gave some to adam because he was right there. People like to pretend like Eve was off lollygagging by herself, frolicking with Satan, eating from the fruit of the tree, but she and Adam were right there together. And I don't imagine that Adam missed seeing a, serp a talking serpent talking to his wife. And I guess he just stood by and watched and watched his wife eat this fruit from the tree that he also knew he was not they were not supposed to eat from like hold up adam why are you not saying no god said don't do that he was like that's on you if you want to sin and then he eats from the fruit of the tree too their eyes are opened they see that they are naked they feel shame and they're hiding from God. They're covering themselves with fig leaves. And God is like, Adam, Eve, where are you? And they're like, uh, we're over here hiding from you in the garden. And God's like, why are you hiding from me? And they're like, because we are naked. Who told you you were naked? So anyway, they got punished for doing the one thing God said you couldn't do. But isn't that like humans? You can do everything you want to do except one thing. And what's the one thing we're going to do? The thing we weren't supposed to do. So they got kicked out of the garden. Um, Adam's punishment was that he's going to have to toil in the soil and that it's not going to be easy for him. 
Eve's punishment was trouble in birthing children, the land and the animals were punished, death entered the world. Um, all of creation groans under this weight. But a lot of people, so I went through the whole story just in case you didn't know it, a lot of people lay all of the blame on Eve. And I would even say particularly at the time this was written, people blamed Eve and said, Eve is why there was the fall of humanity. Eve brought sin into the world. And I don't agree with that. I think Adam and Eve both did it. But what Hopkins writes is, oh God, why were we made to bear all the punishment for Adam's fall? So there are two things. One, she plainly calls it Adam's fall. She's like, Adam is the one who fell. It's his fault that all of humanity is in sin. And if we have to lay the blame on one person, I would go with Adam because his responsibility was to care for Eve and he dropped the ball on that. But if that had never happened, we wouldn't have salvation through Jesus Christ. So I can't say that I'm sad about it, but I'm fascinated that Hopkins squarely places the blame for the fall of humanity on Adam. And she says, why were we made to bear all the punishment for Adam's fall? All the punishment. So she's saying not only did Adam cause the fall, Adam got off scot-free and we women are the ones with the burdens to bear. I am fascinated by that and like, oh, look at look at our touch of feminism. Well, it's more than a touch of feminism throughout, but that was just really blatant to me. So I'll keep reading. A woman's life is hard, hard from the cradle to the grave. Oh God, why were we made to bear all the punishment for Adam's fall? Why are men so cruel? Why did he win her heart to throw at one side as a worthless bauble? Mrs. Bowen was crocheting an afghan and the needle dropped from her long white fingers and a settled look of pain crept like a veil over the beautiful proud face as she gazed into the fire. I would have called it a hook. Do you call crochet hooks hooks or do you call them needles? Um, okay, yeah, I know that's got nothing to do with anything, but interesting to me. So Mrs. Bowen was crocheting an afghan and the needle dropped from her long white fingers and the subtle look of pain crept like a veil over the beautiful proud face as she gazed into the fire. Aurelia had been to see Jewel, had told her with many tears and sobs of the broken engagement between herself and Cuthbert, that they still loved each other, that Sumner blamed himself for believing that he had forgotten her, Aurelia, and had engaged himself to Jewel without realizing the true state of his feelings, and now he would never marry. Neither of them felt that they could know happiness without the thought of Jewel's wrongs before them. Could they not be friends still, she and Jewel? She was so lonely and miserable feeling that she had brought so much suffering on her dear friend. Mrs. Bowen heard it all, but deep in her heart was a doubt of the specious pleader. Yes! Yes, I'm glad somebody is doubting the specious pleader. And come on now, specious pleader? I've got to call somebody a specious pleader. I mean, I won't, but I will want to. I bet I'll think it. All right. I wish we had not been so hasty and had given Cuthbert a chance to explain, she remarked to Jewel one day. Yes, yes. Somebody's talking with some sense now. Yes. There is nothing to explain, replied Jewel, lifting her head proudly. I saw and heard it all for myself. He told me he had only met Aurelia casually at the Cape, leaving almost immediately. Oh, I had forgotten he told that lie. Mm, that's not helping. Now I find beyond a doubt that they were actually engaged. Nothing can alter the fact that he had something co to conceal and that and for that reason deceived me. Then too, Papa has met him at the majors and has heard the gossip of the clubs. It proves itself, Mama. There is nothing more to be said. I, I have learnt my lesson. I shall never be so foolish again. I have to thank Mr. Sumner for teaching me worldly wisdom. Mm. Mm. I had thought better things of Cuthbert. I would never have believed him to be the cruel, selfish man he has proved. Well, 
May he have some peace before he marries Aurelia, for I suppose it will end that way. He will be punished if he marries her, or I greatly mistake her nature. I think this is Jules mom talking, like based on the flow of the conversation. That's what I thought. But the part that he will be punished if he marries her, or I greatly mistake her nature, goes back to Mrs. Bowen calling Aurelia a specious pleader. You specious pleader. Mm. Jewel knelt on, gazing into the fire. She was silent for a time, and then she said gently, you dislike Aurelia, Mama, simply for my sake. It is not like you to be unjust. Mrs. Bowen glanced at her sharply. Um, I, there are people I dislike simply for the sake of my children. Maybe I'm wrong for that, but it's the truth. It is not that alone, Jewel, but I believe her false. I have a presentiment that there is something wrong. Oh, my darling, do be careful. I think it would kill your father if anything happened to you, exclaimed Mrs. Bowen as she folded her daughter in her loving arms. Whoa, I think it would kill your father if anything happened to you. What does she think is going to happen? What is her presentiment about? Gracious. Jewel answered her tender embrace with warm kisses. Dear Mama, the sting is taken out of all the pain when I remember that no matter what comes, my own darling father and mother see no fault in their dear girl. Ah, children who have not needed it yet believe that the wound must be mortal. Children who have... Okay, I did read that correctly. Let me keep going. Ah, children who have not needed it yet believe that the wound must be mortal that cannot be soothed by parental balm and oil. Those dear ones have the power to restore self-respect. Oh, I'm sorry, I got sidetracked by how many pages we have left. Those dear ones have the power to restore self-respect though they may be powerless to restore happiness. Mrs. Bowen put the girl from her and left the room. Yes, I too shall be glad to return to the ranch. It will be quiet and peaceful there. I shall forget. She shivered. Forget, she repeated, pressing her hands to her breast and moving to and fro in agitation. No, no, I shall never forget. I shall remember as long as I live. I'm pretty sure this is Jewel talking. She rose to her feet and began walking the length of the room. The opening of the door aroused her and turning with a slight frown, she saw General Benson. The frown deepened as she saw him place a basket of lovely flowers on a table. She did not desire him to bring her gifts, but this did cause her pain. I'm sorry, but this did not cause her pain. It was the vision of a bygone day when someone else was wont to come softly into the room with beautiful flowers. Her face flushed for a moment, then became paler than ever. She gave ben General Benson her hand silently. He bit his lip when he saw how quickly she withdrew it. Sam told me I should find Mrs. Bowen here, he said courteously. Mama is in her room. I will ring and let her know you are here. Wait one moment, he pleaded. I have brought you some flowers, Miss Jewell. They are very beautiful, she answered coldly, and you are very kind, General Benson. Flowers suit you, he said in his soft, caressing voice that had never failed him with other women, but which was wasted on Jewel. You should always be surrounded with them, Miss Jewell. She did not smile. This man's admiration jarred on her. Her father liked his pleasant ways and found him a good companion to while away the hours, but somehow she could not assume the easy familiarity of friendship with him. She took herself to talk for her growing dis she took herself to talk for her growing dislike of him. She took herself to talk for her growing dislike of him. I have read that a few times now. I am reading it correct. She took herself to talk for her growing dislike of him. I'm not entirely clear on what that sentence means, but we're just going to keep reading and hope that the context reveals it to us. Why should she be so ungenerous to one so kind? Ah, okay. So she's given herself some self-talk about you're being too mean. Why should she shrink from him with a loathing that she could not repress? She had never voiced her feelings, but she knew that her mother felt with her toward this suave diplomatic gentleman. She had once seen him kick the dog that followed him, cowed and faithful only through fear. 
and she disliked him for the cowardly act. She spoke to him about it. All right. Um, you, yeah, why are you kicking dogs? And okay, it's like, I saw you kick this dog. What's up with that? Oh, one must be in the fashion, he replied, never dreaming of the anger and disgust beneath the girl's cold exterior. And dogs were made to kick. People talk a lot of rubbish about the faithfulness of dogs. It's all bosh. Their devotion means dread of the whip or a strong boot, Miss Jewel. Mm, I don't like them either. Jewel's disgust was so great that for the moment she lost all other feeling, every remnant of respect and liking fled. He had forgotten the incident, and though resenting the girl's coldness, he did not associate his own cruelty with it. In fact, he put it down to coquetry, and it only inflamed his admiration and strengthened his determination to make this girl his wife. Mm. He wondered if Senator or Mrs. Bowen would oppose him. If the senator or Mrs. Bowen would oppose him. So he wasn't just worried with the senator. He was worried about Mrs. Bowen too. Jewel's stepmother was a woman of the world and between General Benson and herself, there was no great liking. He felt uneasy in her presence that under her rather haughty matter, a keen sight was hidden that read his motives. Senator Bowen was more to his liking. In reply to Mrs. Bowen's cautious questioning concerning General Benson, the senator's answer was, the government, my dear, gives him its confidence by placing him in a responsible position. That is enough for me. Uncle Sam never employs rascals to transact his business. <laughs> oh my gosh, how could that be any less true? Just because the government says somebody is okay doesn't mean that person has to be okay by you and that Uncle Sam never employs rascals to transact his business. Uncle Sam often employs rascals to transact his business. Now, I'm not saying everybody in government is bad. Please don't hear that. There are a lot of people who serve in government and political positions who are upright and doing great things to help people. But what I am saying, it is totally possible for somebody to be a rascal and to be employed by the US government. Opposition or not, General Benson meant to win in the end. Aurelia might fail with Cuthbert, but he would win with Jewel. He was irritated by the delay. Apart from his vanity, which was injured by Jewel's indifference, it was time the engagement was announced. His creditors were unpleasantly pressing. His property in Baltimore was mortgaged up to its full value. There was nothing for it but this marriage with the California millionaire's heiress. Wow. She hasn't even pretended to like him. And he's like, it's about time for this engagement to be announced. Mm. Heiresses were not easily found. It was only a question of time and management and Jewel must be his wife. It was only a question of time and management. No things like affection, love, or even like. Can we start with like? Just time and management. Yes, you are one of those beings for whom it seems flowers were especially created. I always think of you as a delicate lily or a white rose. Color cues, just saying. The girl's face flushed, but not with pleasure. Mama must see them. She will admire them, she said as she rang the bell and sent a message to Mrs. Bowen. General Benson bit his lip. He had intended speaking to her today, but it was not an easy thing to do. She kept him at bay. Have you seen Miss Madison lately, he asked, sauntering up to the fire. Jewel shook her head. Not this week, and the troubled look returned to her eyes. She is a great girl, said Benson with a laugh. He leaned against the overmantel and stroked his mustache <laughs> like the proverbial villain. She and Sumner are going the pace. I suppose we cannot expect lovebirds to remember anything outside their paradise. Wow. Oh, that was cruel. Benson. Oh, that was like a dagger in my heart. That was like some Shakespearean foolishness right there. Jewel shivered. She loves him still, he said to himself between his teeth. Well, it is no matter. She may love him now, but I shall alter that when she is my wife. Then with the innate cruelty of his nature, he continued, Sumner is to be congratulated if what I hear is true. The Madisons are a fine old Southern family and Miss Aurelia is worthy of her race. He hid a smile behind his hand. 
That's interesting. I mean, he could very, very easily mean like they're they're a fine Southern family and Miss Aurelia is worthy of the race of being fine Southerners, but something about it struck me just odd. And I mean, you know, I'm looking around every corner for Hagar and her daughter, but that was, huh. Does it strike you as, I don't know, a little, a little foreboding maybe? Let's read that again. Sumner is to be congratulated if what I hear is true. The Madisons are a fine old Southern family and Miss Aurelia is worthy of her race. Although if he meant anything other than white and proud, he wouldn't say Sumner was to be congratulated unless he knows something about Sumner's race that we don't know. He hid a smile behind his hand. It is quite refreshing in these matter of fact days to come upon a real genuine romance. Love, they say, is out of fashion. If so, I am afraid Sumner is a long way behind the times, for I am told he is madly in love. That I guess the first time I saw them together, one could read his infatuation in his eyes. Miss Madison's magnificent beauty easily accounts for it. Her face is her fortune, most assuredly. Jewel, Jewel drew herself away a few steps. The pain he hoped to give her was not there. She had schooled herself to bear hearing the news of the engagement at any time. He could arouse her indignation, pride. This he did successfully. Then it is settled. Aurelia is very beautiful, she said quietly. She is my friend, and I think her one of the most beautiful women I have ever seen. He smiled. Ah, pardon, Miss Jewel. I had forgotten while speaking that you were more than ordinarily interested. Always sweet and generous, Miss Jewel, most rarely so, for one beautiful woman seldom acknowledges another. Here is Mama, Jewel turned to the door with a faint sigh of relief. Will you excuse me, General Benson? I want to catch the next mail. General Benson did not stay much longer. He was not at ease with Mrs. Bowen. He was furious with Jewel for retiring and leaving him with her mother. What else was she going to do? That was clearly going to be her move. He set it down against her in his book of reckoning to be settled in a future not far distant. Okay, so he's got a book of reckoning against her, and I can only imagine that he is envisioning her as his wife, and he using her in mean ways to reckon these misdeeds she's done against him. Mrs. Bowen went to Jewel after he was gone. You have not looked at your flowers, Blossom, she said gently. Her daughter colored. They are very beautiful, but they give you no pleasure. I do not like presents from General Benson. You do not like him, queried her mother, stroking the wonderful coils of shining hair. The girl shivered. No, no, I do not like him at all. He is very kind, but I cannot bring myself to like him, Mama dear. Mrs. Bowen kissed her brow. Nor do I. He is a bad man, and I shall find a way to stop his calling here. She paused a moment, lost in deep thought. Perhaps it is well that we do not return to Washington next fall. I am glad your father has so decided. The small hours of the morning found Jewel still sitting before her bedroom fire. She had returned from a reception and had dismissed her maid, telling Venus that she would manage without her. She was thinking of words she had heard that confirmed the report that Sumner and Aurelia were engaged. She had not seen the latter for a number of days, but she felt that she might expect her at any moment to confirm the report. What is first love? Some say first love is calf love, a silly infatuation for an insipid hero or heroine. Others will tell you first love is the only true passion, that it comes but once to every human being, that the intense yearning for the sound of a beloved voice, the sight of an adored face, the clasp of a hand only fills the heart once in a lifetime. The question as to whether it is the deepest love must be answered by each individual. That's really interesting. So some say first love is just foolishness. Some say first love is your only true passion. But the question is, what is the depth of that love? You might have a fifth love, but the depth of that love can surpass other things, huh? The heart knoweth its own bitterness, says Holy Writ, so also it knoweth its own joy. Jewel was a firm believer in the strength of first love, and now she found herself suffering the pangs of love despised, the anguish of disappointment, the humiliation of neglect. 
ever before her inner sight was the merry dancing daring and glancing fun in those dark eyes so recently her son how little she had been to him that he could so soon forget oh they were beautiful eyes she thought with a stirring of the old rapture at her heart what a noble face he has high bred refined and manly too there was not another man to compare with him and he belonged to another a bitter pang smote upon her a keen memory of the events of the past weeks she wept over her baseless dreams and prayed for strength to solve the problem of her life how shall i meet him she asked herself how shall i be calm conventional to mr and mrs cuthbert sumner long she sat there pondering many things well that was chapter 18 of pauline hopkins hagar's daughter until next time